Good morning, everyone. I'd just like to begin by demonstrating that when intermittent sprint exercise that replicates the work rest durations and durations of uh, and durations of field-based team sports is performed in the heat, that um, our performance is actually decreased. And previous research has suggested that the decrease in performance that we see here is actually related to the effect of generally hyperthermia on the central nervous system. Now, I'd just like to point out that an important point here is that with respect to the effect of, the, of uh, the central nervous system, that no measures of neuromuscular fatigue were actually performed during these studies, so we can't refute or confirm um, that suggestion. Now, with respect to neuromuscular fatigue in intermittent sprint type exercise, it's generally concerned with examining repeated sprint ability, where 10 to 15 sprints have been completed uh, with short duration recoveries of about 30 seconds. And that's generally been done using the interpolated twitch technique. Uh, now, using this technique, we can get insight into central and peripheral fatigue that was described yesterday. And when we uh, look at the research in this field, we can find that when repeated sprints are completed with short duration recoveries, we generally see evidence of a peripheral fatigue, but also evidence of a small but significant central fatigue. Now, recently, it's um, also been suggested in um, repeated sprint ability, but also in experimental football matches, that when we have one short recoveries or whether we replicate intermittent sprint exercise that is similar to uh, field-based team sports, that the effect uh, of the environment is, is not contributing to the neuromuscular fatigue. So neuromuscular fatigue is independent of uh, the environmental condition. Now, the interpolated twitch technique allows us to examine both central and peripheral fatigue, but it doesn't allow the site of central fatigue to be localized. With transcranial magnetic stimulation, we're able to localize the site of central fatigue. Since any additional increase in voluntary force uh, during an MVC when TMS is superimposed suggests that there's a, uh, an insufficient output from the motor cortex to drive the, the motor neuron pool optimally. So therefore, we can suggest that this decrement in cortical drive is, is evidence of a, a supraspinal component to fatigue. Now, using this technique, um, it's recently been demonstrated that in, again, repeated sprint ability with short duration sprints, that there is predominantly um, a peripheral fatigue and that the capacity of the motor cortex to drive the motor neuron pool optimally is well sustained during brief MVCs. So it's, it's just important to point out that a lot of the work has looked at repeated sprint ability, which has been identified uh, throughout the conference as being important to performance. But uh, no studies to date have examined the effect of intermittent sprint exercise in the heat using TMS um, on neuromuscular fatigue. Um, in addition, we regularly use heat acclimation to reduce the effect of, of heat on performance, and no study is actually examined yet, although obviously evidence is on the way, that uh, whether heat acclimation can reduce neuromuscular fatigue during intermittent sprint exercise that replicates field-based team sports. So the purpose of the study was to examine the effect of progressive heat acclimation um, on neuromuscular fatigue during intermittent sprint exercise in the heat using both transcranial magnetic stimulation but also femoral nerve stimulation. In terms of experimental design for the study, our participants were required to attend the labs on 16 occasions. This started with some baseline testing and some neuromuscular function uh, practice and familiarization. Then they completed the CISP in 33 degrees and 50% humidity. The CISP is a 40-minute protocol, intermittent sprinting-based. It's 22-minute blocks of exercise, and in each block you have a 10-second passive rest, a 5-second sprint, and then you complete 105 seconds of recovery at a power equal to 35% of VO2 peak. Pre and post the intermittent sprint protocol, we performed a neuromuscular uh, function assessment, again using TMS, MVC, and femoral nerve stimulation. On completion of the intermittent sprint exercise, participants were divided into the acclimation group and the training group. Now, the acclimation group, uh, we, it's been demonstrated that in traditional acclimation protocols, you tend to get a reduction in physiological strain across the protocol. So we opted for a progressive heat acclimation protocol, and that uh, nine participants completed 12 days of exercise, one hour per day at 50% VO2 peak. To achieve a, a sustained physiological strain, we progressed the heat stress during the protocol. So on days one to four, they operated at 30 degrees and 50% humidity, and days five to eight, 33 degrees and 50% humidity, and then on day nine to 12, we increased it 35 degrees and 70% humidity. Now the training group, 
They completed 12 days, 60 minutes per day at 50% of VO2 peak, and that was sustained at 20 degrees and 50% relative humidity. On completion of uh, training or acclimation, again, the intermittent sprint protocol was completed in the heat with neuromuscular function assessment immediately pre and post. In terms of the protocol that was used to assess neuromuscular function, uh, there was a standardized warm-up, and participants then completed three maximal voluntary contractions of five seconds with femoral nerve stimulation immediately post the MVC. And then they complete three sets of a complete MVC, a 75% MVC, and a 50% MVC with transcranial magnetic stimulation superimposed during the actual MVC. Moving to the results of the study, we look first at the physiological responses to 12 days of heat acclimation or control. Um, and what we have here is our resting heart rate and our resting uh, rectal temperatures on day one and day 12 of acclimation. And we can see that in, in this study, we had uh, the, the physiological, or sorry, the um, uh, progressive heat acclimation inducing a significant reduction, uh, whereas there was no effective training. When we move to exercise responses, because of the progressive protocol, there's an artificial uh, increase in strain, so we don't see any reduction to allow us to see a change. So we have to look at the physiologic responses during the intermittent sprint exercise. And here we have exercise heart rate and exercise rectal temperature. There was a 17 beat per minute reduction in exercise heart rate uh, from sprint protocol one to two. Rectal temperature tended to decline, but it wasn't significantly different. Other measures included exercise skin temperature. This was reduced in both groups, but it was significant in the heat acclimation group. Moving to our measures of neuromuscular fatigue, here we have the change in MVC force in newtons, and this was pre-post intermittent sprint exercise, before and after our heat acclimation or our control. And we can see here that in terms of MVC force, there was a significant reduction pre-post the first bout of intermittent sprint exercise. After 12 days of progressive heat acclimation, that reduction uh, persisted. When we move to the control group, again, a significant reduction in MVC force uh, pre-post intermittent sprint exercise. After 12 days of training, we can see again that there was a, a persistent reduction in MVC force. Let's say we can examine uh, peripheral fatigue uh, in this study. We use the potentiated twitch as our measure of uh, peripheral fatigue. And here we have the percentage change pre-post intermittent sprint exercise, again, before and after heat acclimation or control. Now, potentiated twitch was reduced 25%, uh, significantly so after the first cyst. And then after 12 days of heat acclimation, we again see that there was a, a significant uh, persistent reduction in potentiated twitch force. In the control group, pre-post the first intermittent sprint bout, there was a significant reduction. Uh, 12 days of training did not reduce the, uh, the reduction in uh, potentiated twitch force. There was a significant effect still. <coughs> Other measures of peripheral fatigue to give us further insight included maximal rate of force development, maximal rate of relaxation, and relaxation halftime. These were unchanged pre-post intermittent sprint exercise uh, and also unaffected by either intervention. In respect to central fatigue, we looked at cortical voluntary activation. And again, here's a percentage change. There were small uh, changes in cortical voluntary activation pre and post the first cyst, but also um, they persisted after heat acclimation. Similar uh, results obtained in the control group, but none of the changes in cortical voluntary activation were significantly different. Additional measures uh, of cortical spinal excitability uh, were unchanged pre, post, intermittent sprint exercise, heat acclimation, uh, or control. Moving to some of the EMG data, here we've got the RMS M-max ratio, and we've got the M-max amplitude, and again, we've got for CIS1 and CIS2 for the heat acclimation and control groups, and we can see that uh, these measures were largely unaffected um, by the intermittent spirit protocol and also by the uh, heat acclimation intervention or the control. Briefly to the performance data, here's the peak power output and the work done during the 40-minute intermittent sprint exercise. It was unchanged in the heat acclimation group and also in the control group. Um, it's important to note that when we looked at the change over time, that there was a 7% reduction um, in the heat acclimation group in CISP1, and actually in the, in the second CISP after heat acclimation, there was still a 7% reduction in performance. With respect to the control group, a 5% reduction in CISP1 and a 3% reduction in CISP2. Work done, again, no significant changes in work done in e after either intervention. Um, but with respect to the change in work done over time, 
we can see that there was a 5% reduction in CIS-1, there was only a 1% reduction after heat acclimation across time. Also a tendency in the control group for the work done uh, to be better maintained after the second CISP. So in terms of the conclusions of the study, uh, with respect to neuromuscular fatigue, the evidence would suggest that fatigue during 40 minutes of intermittent sprint exercise in the heat may be primarily peripheral in origin due to lack of change in central measures, but we didn't look at any uh, spinal mediated fatigue. Um, with respect to heat acclimation, the data suggests that there's efficacy to a progressive heat acclimation uh, protocol in conferring the heat acclimated phenotype. Um, evidence suggests, supporting what was uh, uh, presented yesterday, that heat acclimation did not reduce the extent of neuromuscular fatigue, but there was evidence of a reduced physiological strain um, during the exercise. Uh, finally, there was some evidence of a trend towards better maintenance of work done across uh, 20 sprints or 40 minutes of exercise after heat acclimation, but also in the training group. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Aspatar and Drs. Rasnas and Periard for the opportunity to come and present my research today, and also my colleagues back at the University of Brighton. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, the floor is open for questions. Thank you for your study. That can have some potential implication to design training for athletes during a heat training camp. My question is, you have been presenting all of your results as a delta from before to post-test. Mm -hmm. Did you analyze as well the data pre-test? And do you have any effect of heat acclimatization on the absolute value before to do the exercise? Yeah, uh, the data was just presented as change primarily because of the number of, of uh, bars that will be on each, each graph. Uh, we, we did do most of the analysis on absolute measures, uh, and again, similar to what we find, we find here, basically. Absolute measures and the percentage change were, were the same, basically. Thank you. Great, great study. Very interesting. Um, you said at the end that you saw a trend towards, um, after heat acclimation, towards better performance and better training. Uh, in the study, you did a five-second contraction. Mm -hmm. Do you think that possibly if you'd extended that to 20 or 30-second contraction, do you think you would have seen a better maintenance of, of, um, of force during the contraction after heat acclimatization or acclimation? Uh, well, I think based on the evidence presented yesterday that maybe the heat acclimation process may actually have no impact on it. I think when looking back on the study, um, the five second contraction replicates perhaps what we might see in an intermittent sprint activity with, with, you know, between two and five second sprints in field based team sports. I think if we wanted to examine the mechanism, perhaps similar to the study that came out in 2013, we may use a longer MVC and then we may see changes in the capacity of the motor cortex to actually sustain um, the, the uh, output and the drive. Might be interesting as well to look at, I said that you used the quadriceps there, yes. to, to look at the quadriceps as well as the... As the plantar um, flexors. Yeah, plantar flexors, just to see the difference with, with sure. muscle group and fiber types. But very interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? I had just a small uh, methodological question. How certain are you that your TMS manipulation was always done in exactly this, of, at exactly the same location? Sure. When participants came to be familiarized, uh, we identified for the TMS the, the hotspot. Um, that was then recorded, uh, marked with permanent pen, and each time the participants came back to the lab, we then went through the process of I, not only just looking for the original marking, but also going through all of the resting motor thresholds and, and re-familiarizing the participants. So for every session uh, that involved TMS, th that was undertaken. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Then thank you. we move on to the next speaker.